This is a metaphor for your business's journey. Sometimes it feels like you're going 100 miles an hour, barely keeping up. But to cruise through challenges, you need someone who's right there with you. That's what Dell Technologies Advisors do. They have the Windows PCs and tech advice you need to get past whatever's in front of you and get where you want to go. Call an advisor today at 877-ASK-DELL. That's 877-ASK-DELL. A start to a simpler experience with Windows 11 Pro. At some point far in the future, historians will probably ask, what was daily life like in the early 21st century? Well, one thing we know for sure, nobody will ever point to these two clowns and say, this was how you should have been stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and it's National Thomas Jefferson Day. So we're going to talk about him and his bowling team partner, Benny Franklin. The two of them collaborated on a little iPhone notes memo called the Declaration of Independence. Today, to tell us about Ben Franklin's remarkable afterlife gamble, we welcome Michael Meyer. In headlines, people in the housing market are worried mortgage rates are rising too fast. What does it mean for you? We'll share tips and I'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Stephen with a question about moving to an area with a higher cost of living. On purpose! Then, I'll share my Jeffersonian trivia. And now, two guys who are the Ben and Tom of this basement, helping you write your Declaration of Financial Ascendance, it's Joe and O j j j j g Hey there, stackers. Welcome to the Midway Point in your week. I'm Joe Salci. I average Joe money on Twitter, and I love OG that Doug now has taken responsibility for the Haven Lifeline. On Monday, I went back and listened. He's in that little recording booth we have telling our audience behind our back that we don't even let him participate, and now he's throwing out the Haven Lifeline. We're not throwing it out. He's throwing it out. It's good. I like to supervise anyway, so (laughs) it's if I could be like, that direction, throw it there. Oh, geez, the guy in the orange vest was just standing there with a shovel. Hasn't moved it in four hours. I have a whistle. That's that's my job. We got a great show today. I don't know what to do with that, so I'm going to transition out. We got, we got a great show today. You know, when you find a guy that's written a book about Ben Franklin and your name of your show is Stacking Benjamins, we're contractually obligated to have this guy on. But not only that, Michael Meyer is a fantastic historian and a guy that has written just some phenomenal stuff. He's a professor at Pitt as well, even though he lives in Taipei. We'll actually talk about why during his intro. How does he squeeze all of that in, in between his horror movie acting? I know, right? Yeah. He puts the mask on, does all that stuff too. It's a guy's guy's versatile Renaissance man, Doug Renaissance man. I thought they were all gone. And uh, headlines about mortgage rates, what's going on in the housing economy. We're going to talk about that. But first, people don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. Let's not forget about doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, under eating and overeating. Stress shows up in all kinds of ways. And a world that's telling you to do more, sleep less, and grind all the time. Well, here's a reminder to take care of yourself, do less, and maybe try some therapy. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and the Stacking Benjamin Show listeners. Stackers, guess what? You'll get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash stacker. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash stacker. Hey, Stackers, a vast is a global leader in cybersecurity for more than 30 years and is trusted by over 435 million 
Users, Avast empowers you with digital safety and privacy, no matter who you are, where you are, or how you connect. Enjoy the opportunities that come with being connected, but on your terms. Avast's new all-in-one solution called Avast One helps you take control of your safety and privacy online through a range of features. Features like antivirus, award-winning antivirus that stops viruses and malware from harming your device, or data breach monitoring, enabling you to find out if your online accounts have been compromised and whether your passwords need to be changed, or firewall protection, keep personal information secure and prevent attacks that seek to access our computers and steal our data. You can learn more about Avast One, by the way, at avast.com. All right, housing, interest rates, Ben Franklin, what more do you want? It's Wednesday on the Stacky Benjamin Show. Let's go. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our headline today comes to us from the Wall Street Journal and our uh, good friend Veronica Dagger. Veronica has been on this show. Veronica writes, as mortgage rates rise, home sellers fear time is running out to cash in, OG. People worried that, you know what? Mortgage rates are going to make these, uh, these low prices a little bit more impossible. She says, blood pressure is now rising along with home prices and mortgage rates as homeowners fear missing out on the right moment to stake the for sale sign in the front yard. The mood among sellers seems to have shifted in recent weeks from apathy about the slow boil of higher rates to urgency, financial advisors and real estate agents said. Sellers are seeking advice on how best to time the market and tame their anxiety. Are you kidding me? Timing the market? I think the the thing to do here, tell me if I'm wrong, the thing to do is go, go, do it, do it now, do it quick. What's What's the line from Star Wars? Try not, do or do not. There is no try. I think it's a little bit of alarmist. I think a smidge, right? I mean, if you're a real estate agent, what's your job? To kind of sort of get listings, right? Quick, <laughs> now. You know, not, don't don't let them, you know, kick the can down the road a little bit. So, you know, you want to put some anxiety out there. You want to put some fear into the uh, the sales process and say, eh, I don't know, man, interest rates are going up. That's true. By the way, interest rates are going up. Does it affect affordability? A little bit, sure does. I mean, if it goes to 5 or 7%, it sure will. Does it at 4 I mean... I think we have to look back more over a longer period of time than just the last 18 months. Say, yeah, but no, 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 they were at 2.2 like last Christmas. Like, right. I know that, but that was ridiculous. That was <laughs> manufactured, right? The numbers before that were in the threes and fours, which by the way, are also insanely good. You know, ask your parents what their interest rates on their house was. You know, right. Joe, your first house interest rate on your house was not three or four or five. It was seven and a half. I yeah. love how he transitioned from ask your parents to Joe, what was Grandpa, your first interest rate? Tell us a story. If you wouldn't cut me off, I had a sequence of a timeline, what I was going to say to kind of illustrate the point, but now it's ruined. Thank you very much. My point was... It's what I do. Joe bought his first house at seven. I bought my house at six. You refinanced at five, so on and so forth. This is still historically really good interest rates. And it's fantastic to borrow money at this rate if you want to borrow money or not. You know, it's also okay to pay off all your bills and not owe anybody any money because that's cool. Uh, Well, let me let me run a scenario by you. Let's say that in my financial plan, a year and a half from now, let's say 18 months from now, that's a good timeline. You had planned that 18 months from now, you want to sell your house. And you're seeing interest rates going up. You're seeing that uh, houses are maybe taking a smidge longer to sell than they were before. Do you accelerate that timeline and sell now? Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends. It's market dependent. Is there a little bit more days on market than there were some six months ago? I'm not sure. It really depends on where you are. I have a client who bought a house in California and it sold for many, many dollars, much, much dollar, much B dollar. Uh, It sold for a ton over asking because the it's hotter than the hinges of, you know, where. So I think it's really market dependent. So maybe, is that, is that good enough answer? Maybe you should do that. 
It depends. I would also say on what's the alternative. If 18 months is like just the, eh, yeah, it'd be nice if in 18 months I was going to sell my house and we were going to retire. But if the economy's crappy or the market's down a whole bunch, you might not retire anyway at that time. So if it's not a hard and fast timeline, I don't know why you'd really stress it right now. It's funny because a lot of this also seems colloquial, right? We look at what should happen versus what is happening. Colloquially, we think that, that hey, uh, I hear these stories about interest rates go up and this is the way that this stuff works, so we should see demand uh, diminish. But so far, Veronica writes, home buyer demand seems resilient, and in a further boon to sellers, the inventory of homes on the market remains low. Sellers may want to act quickly, given that, as the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas put it, quote, there's growing concern that U.S. house prices are again becoming unhinged from fundamentals. This is also the group that eight months ago was like, eh, inflation's not really Inflation thing, not so. happening. Yeah. What's it? The vice chairman for the Federal Reserve's like, it's okay. It's not really doing, it's not a thing. Don't sweat it. And now they're sweating it, dropping a, a knowledge bomb of, well, maybe it's not great. I saw an interesting piece the other day on Twitter, and I feel like it was from one of the folks from Ritholtz. Of course, we just had, you know, one of their top guys, uh, Nick, Monday on the show. But I don't think it was, I don't think he posted about this, but, but it was the historical returns of real estate at different levels. Like, you know, interest rates were at this and what did housing prices do? Interest rates, they're all positive. Housing prices still go up. <laughs> they just, they just don't double. Like, you know, everybody's used to this. Yeah, my house was worth 500 grand and now I can sell it for a million. I just have to get that to happen twice more so and I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, it's going to be another like, three years. That's not normal. Just three years, it doubles twice. I'm good. Yeah, and three years from now, I can sell this baby <laughs> for $5.8 million and I got, my, I got my fire. I'm fired out. You know, it's, it's not normal. Unless you're going to move to an apartment, which also carries with it higher costs today because of inflation, you're going to just buy back into the same market. So... I don't think it's as big of a deal as everybody thinks. It's going to affect the second houses. Absolutely. You know, you're, the people who have excess cash that are thinking about, like, how do I get my lake house? You can do that. You can stretch that a little bit more when you have low interest rates and a good economy and so on and so forth. If those things start drying up, that's where the impact will happen in my Humblest of opinions. Well, Veronica Dagger completely agrees with you. And oh, she perfect. writes that because... People look at real estate nationally. They think about this incorrectly. The first thing to do is to look in your backyard, where you plan to sell, where you plan to buy, and see what's going on there because it's a piece-by-piece -piece, uh, situation. But regardless, if you are, or is it irregardless? Is it irregardless? It, yes. Irregardlessness. Yes, irregardlessness. The big question is, if you're new to this whole lending landscape, let's talk about exactly what questions you should ask. And a great site called consumeradvocate.org, consumer protection site, has some questions that you should ask whenever you get a loan. And I thought we'd walk through these. Number one, what type of loans do you offer and what are the qualifying guidelines for each? So there's fixed rate, adjustable rate, FHA, and a veterans association loan. We don't have to do the 201 on these. We'll save that for our newsletter OG, but just a very quick difference between fixed adjustable FHA and a veterans association loan. Uh, well, I mean, some of them overlap, right? You can have a VA loan yeah. that's fixed and FHA loan that's fixed. It just kind of matters what your qualifications are. If you're showing up to the bank with exactly 3.01% down, you know, and it's your first home and you have very little credit established and not a lot of down payment or income, you might be in the FHA. If you're a veteran, obviously look at the VA. If you're what we would call a conventional borrower, You'd look at more of a fixed or variable. If you think interest rates are going to go down, you should get a variable one. That would be that would be a bold <laughs> right move. Now, it'd be <laughs> <Yeah, that's, laughs> you know, I mean, you got to be a pretty damn big optimist, I think, to if, make that. If move. You want to? I would walk into the bank and be like, "I'm going to take one of them variable rate uh, mortgages." <laughs> the banker will be like, "Yes, you will." It's sir. like the <laughs> but it, what do they call it? They don't call it fast pass at Disney anymore. It's like the lightning lane. They're like, oh, there's a line of 50 people in the fixed rate one. You get to go to the front if you want You you want a variable yeah. loan. Yeah. Yes. Cha-ching, cha-ching. 
We'll take it. Uh, so I don't know that you'll see a lot of those. And then, and then within those categories, it depends on the amount that you're borrowing. If you're trying to borrow uh, a, a normal amount, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, then you're a regular borrower. If it gets above whatever the number is in your county, it's different. But it's you know six or seven hundred thousand, then you have a jumbo loan, which is a whole different thing altogether. So lots of different ways to cut that up. And brings up their second question: What is the interest rate and the annual percentage rate? And the difference between those, the rate is the rate. That is what you're going to pay, and that's going to be based on the size of the loan. Once again, a, a jumbo is going to have a higher interest rate than a normal loan. And that's going to be based on your credit score. So that's, you want to pull your credit score ahead of time and see if there's some quick things you can do to maybe clean up your credit. And that will drive down your interest rate maybe a little bit, but the APR is important OG because it not only is the interest rate, but that also includes all the fees. This is what the rate is. If we include all the fees, all the extra charges that are going to get thrown in. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's cost to do business. There's cost to borrow money. You know, bankers got to get paid. The mortgage guys got to get paid, so on and so forth. So you want to know. Well, what those and that, costs and that are. is a key. And this skips down to number six. APR is going to include those fees. So what costs are you going to have? And then look up which one of those are negotiable. Are there are there negotiable fees? Can you estimate and explain what those fees are? as well as how much you're going to make off of off of the loan. Another big one, by the way, is, is there going to be a prepayment penalty? And, and we rarely see this, OG, but some of these lenders, a little shady, and if there's a prepayment penalty, I think I would try as hard as I can to walk away from that one. Yeah, never in a million years. You want I mean, not, not, not in today's day and age. Next question, how large of a deposit do you need? There's a thing called PMI, which is mortgage insurance. You would think the private mortgage insurance protects you it's not made to protect you it's made to protect the bank that's insurance that the bank gets because you didn't put much money down yeah i mean pmi is basically the worst thing imaginable so if you can figure out a way around it up to and including just don't buy that house it will be better off because it's very hard to get rid of the mortgage people will tell you it's the easiest thing oh as soon as you hit this number then magically it goes away it's not you have to apply to have it go away you got to pay for a, a new appraisal yeah you got to have a new appraisal done and who hires the appraiser by the way yeah not you not you the, the guy who's collecting the premium the guy who's collecting the insurance money from you is the one that goes why don't why don't we have bill go out there and tell us oh uh, so snap. close it's just, uh, so maybe maybe in another year and a half it'll be there so figure out a way around PMI, do two loans, buy a smaller house, make a bigger down payment. Just don't have, just don't have. Notice PMI. that later on, we're bringing up the next question, which is what's the monthly payment going to be? This is where most people start. You don't want to start with monthly payment. Ask all these other questions first and then get to the payment. Of course, make sure that that fits in with your, with your overall plan. And then do you offer loan rate locks? And right now I think OG might be a decent time if you're, looking and you're not sure what you're going to buy to maybe lock in a rate. Yeah, uh, a little bit. I mean, mortgages are such a commodity now that you can kind of go down the path with your local banker and then start shopping that. You know what I mean? Get get your pre-approval done so you kind of know where you're supposed to be looking. Um, don't walk in. You know, if the bank says you're approved for $400,000, do not go walk into a $500,000 house. I will save. I will spoil the ending for you. They're generally nicer. $800,000 houses are bigger. They have cooler stuff inside than $400,000 houses. Don't walk into one because you'll say, I really want this. I didn't know they put crown molding on ceilings. It looks nice. Yes, it does. <laughs> it's very nice, but you don't need it if you're approved for four hundred k. So it gives you a sense of where you, know, where you should be shopping. And then as you kind of move down the path, then you can take the transaction and say, how do I optimize this transaction? So kind of take it a step at a time. Deeper into this, what are mortgage or discount points and how do they affect your loan? If you're going to be in a house a long time, paying some points up front will increase your cost, but could drive that interest rate to the floor where you never have to think about refinancing again. What are the closing costs? How much will mine be? What is escrow? I love some of these questions. We will link to this, by the way, not just in the show notes, but we'll do a deeper dive in our 201, our newsletter, where we do a deeper dive into all the topics we talk about. StackyBedjamins.com slash 201, the number 201 gets you signed up for that of course it's always free and if you're not finding value in it you can always unsubscribe but we we uh aim to please with the 201 good stuff there og i think our i think our takeaway is though start with your debt strategy i, I wouldn't start off with oh my goodness interest rates going up i gotta lock stuff in 
is to start off with what's my strategy and get it done. I mean, how long have we been warning people that at some point interest rates are going to go up? So get your risk management strategy put together. Yep. Or just pay it off and not owe anybody any money. That's also a good strategy. So good. Freedom from worry. Hey, coming up next, Michael Meyer took this wide route to the story of Ben Franklin's (laughs) remarkable afterlife, which included this big bet that he made that he's going to tell us the story about. His route started when he was sent to China as one of its first Peace Corps volunteers. And he has authored three critically acclaimed books that are set there, as well as tons of stories that have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times. And he's even been on This American Life with our friend Ira Glass. I call him our friend kind of euphemistically, but it's always good to think about Ira Glass as your friend, isn't it? Everybody assumes that all the stars in Hollywood know each other because they're all in the same business. And it's like all the podcasters. And yeah, I mean, that's how we, Ira Glass, we're like besties. Yeah, we hang out with Ira on Saturdays. Right. He is a currently a Fulbright scholar in Taipei and a fellow at Oxford University Center for Life Writing, working on a biography about Taiwan. Fascinating guy, professor at University of Pittsburgh. By the way, with another cool thing that we're not going to talk about with him, he lives in a house right down the road from Fred Rogers' old house in Squirrel Hill. How about that? He is Mr. Rogers' neighbor in the neighborhood. And now he's on the Stacking Benjamin Show. Michael Meyer coming up next. But first, Doug, I think you got some historical trivia for us, my friend. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson spent nine months together in Paris. Franklin already had a prestigious career, and Jefferson was the NKOB. They later collaborated on the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson wrote the first draft, Franklin edited it, and Jefferson probably emailed all his friends to complain about the edits. Jefferson was just 33 when he put his John Hancock on the document, but my question is, how old was Franklin when he finally signed the Declaration of Independence? Was it 50, 60, or 70 years old? I'll be back with the answer right after I go powder my wig, if you know what I mean. Hey, we talk a lot about how the social security system works and how your credit score system works. But have you seen, have you seen all this stuff, OG, about the uh, social score they have in China? Well, guess what? Our friend Jordan Harbinger has had two episodes on just here recently about how the Chinese social credit score system works. And in fact, it's so interesting. It is in two parts. He's got a part one and a part two. He's also had Susan Kanon recently talking about introverts uniting for a quiet revolution. There's always something interesting. And Jordan always tackles these topics in a way that we would never expect. Of course, this episode brought to you by the Jordan Harbinger Show. If you want a new podcast to look forward to each week, one that's entertaining, informative, and packed with actionable content, well, of course you do, don't you? The average podcast listener has six shows in rotation, so you're most likely not just listening to Stacky Benjamins, are you? And that's totally okay. In fact, this podcast, The Jordan Harbinger Show, is one of my personal favorites. It's a top-shelf podcast named Best of Apple back in 2018. So don't just ignore my suggestion to listen to this one like you probably do with your other friends when they tell you to listen to podcasts. I love what my buddy Jordan does. He dives into the minds of fascinating people from athletes, authors, and scientists to mobsters, spies, and hostage negotiators. And of course, talking about the new Chinese social scoring system, just another one of those great quirky things that he tackles absolutely so well. Jordan is best in class when it comes to podcasting, and he's got one of the most highly rated self-development shows out there right now. So I don't think you can go wrong with adding the Jordan Harbinger show to your rotation. Incredibly interesting. Never a dull show. Search for the Jordan Harbinger show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? 
And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV, even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, add the easy-to-use Geico mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance and more, and choosing to switch to Geico becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to Geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. Hey there, stackers. I'm demonstration of codependence and original DoorDash receipt signer, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I know we're all looking forward to retirement, but old Ben didn't seem to get the message. He signed the Treaty of Paris at the age of 77 and the Constitution at 81, just three years before his death. After a career of being a printer, he sure spent the latter part of his life as a scribbler. So, how old was Franklin when he finally signed the Declaration of Independence? He was 70. And now, to help us understand how we can learn from Franklin, let's hear from Michael Meyer. And on my dad, shortwave radio from halfway across the world, my new friend, Michael Myers is here. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me. Well, any guy that writes about Ben Franklin, we have to have, I was telling you earlier, we're contractually obligated to have you on the show because of our naming convention. But what's fascinating to me is in the introduction, you talk about how you got interested in Ben Franklin. Did you do something naughty, Michael, at a at a event at the State Department? Is that what happened? I did. I, you know, prior to my going to a, a lunch for the then Chinese president, Hu Jintao, at the State Department, if I thought of Benjamin Franklin at all, it was, you know, the guy on the $100 bill, and kind of the American Yoda, you know, with the, the cute quips and the, the sage philosophy. And I walked into this event at the State Department and someone later told me they always invite one writer. You know, if you invite two writers, you're in trouble because they'll sit in the corner and <laughs> complain. Um, but you look classy <laughs> if you have one. And I felt very overwhelmed. I mean, Colin Powell was talking to Barbara Streisand and Yo-Yo Ma was playing his cello. And so I went into a side room and I leaned, I put my hand on a table and from the Behind me, from the, the side of the wall, a voice said, don't touch that. And I went, oh. Whoa. And it was a Marine guard. And he said, that's the table where Benjamin Franklin signed the Treaty of Paris. And I immediately thought, what's the Treaty of Paris? <laughs> and I, I started talking to the Marine about different things about Franklin. And you know, the Marine was saying, oh, he's the father of the Foreign Service. And here's why. And we started talking. And it was, you know, as one does, I went back to the hotel room and started Googling him because I felt really stupid. I'd spent the last decade of my life working in China as a journalist. And I knew more about Chinese dynasties than I did about the founding of my own country. And yeah. those searches led to me reading his remarkable last will and testament and thinking, why hasn't someone written a book about this? And you know it's time to write a book when the book you want to read doesn't exist. So that launched me on this project. And as you dove in, you found out something. I, I felt like I knew a lot about Ben Franklin before I read your book. And then I realized how little I knew because you fill in so many of these nooks and crannies. But one thing, Franklin, as you open the book, he thought a lot about his death. Like he really, yeah. really planned a lot around his death. He was, you know, very much out of favor with a lot of his fellow founders or people at the Constitutional Convention. You know, there was no eulogy. There was no state funeral for Benjamin Franklin. That shocked me. His American eulogy wasn't read till almost a year after he had passed. And then it was read by his arch nemesis, a man he loathed. And so you're right. You know, his last will and testament was sort of this farewell score settling, if you will, right? Where he, and all wills are like this. I'm sure listeners know this. Like Maybe you've been on the, the wrong end of this where... Wills can tell the story of a life, and they can also settle a lot of scores. And Franklin's will, he knew it would be public. Um, he knew it would be published. And he made sure that all the gifts he was giving came with moral lessons attached. And that's what led me to the gift he left to Boston and Philadelphia, his loan scheme for young tradesmen. 
Well, what I found even even fascinating at the beginning of this whole thing was he had had an original will where a lot of his stuff went to his family. And you go deeply into his family. Tell me a little bit about Franklin's family that he originally left a lot to. This is also another reason I have to say I really felt I felt very close to Mr. Franklin. I think a lot of people can relate to this, that his family relationships just changed over time. His son, William, was set to inherit everything. His son, William, was probably the guy that held the kite while Franklin touched his knuckle to the key in, in 1752. But his son, William, was the royal governor of New Jersey and sided with the British in the American Revolution. He was a loyalist until the end. And so Franklin made a point, you know, in his will to say this final version of his will to say to my son who betrayed me and betrayed our country, I give you da 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 the grand sum of nothing. You know, he gave him some barren lands up in what is today Nova Scotia. And then, you know, he made a point to give his daughter Sally the bulk of his estate, the most expensive items, including uh, a portrait that Louis XVI had given Franklin when he was departing France, uh, ringed with three rows of uh, three circles of diamonds. And Franklin made a point there in the will, too, to say, look, I know that women aren't allowed to own their own property. He's predating the end of laws of coverture by a good 50 years here. And he said, I know that, but this is your gift alone to keep. And he even made a point to say in the will to your husband, this is Sally's, <laughs> this is Sally's gift. Uh, you can't touch it. This is for her own independence to ensure that she'll never need to depend on a man the rest of her life. And then he had two grandsons and he made sure that each grandson, you know, their gift came with a lesson as well. So Temple, who was his uh, son, William's illegitimate son, William was illegitimate. And then William himself had an illegitimate son, Temple. And Franklin said, I want to make something out of you yet. And so I'm going to give you all my papers and I want you to be my biographer, which as you read the book, find out Temple really squandered this gift. And then finally, you know, Franklin realized that I never taught anyone my trade. I was a printer by training. I am a leather apron man, as he called himself. He belonged to the leather apron class. And so to Benny, Sally's son, he left his printing press. And Benny, I think, you know, I spend a chapter on Benny's fate because Benny really carries forward Franklin's spirit and sort of upholds the idea of what a free press means to the American Republic. One of those enemies had a name for Benny, and I don't remember it offhand. But Lightning but, but, Rod Jr. Lightning Rod Jr. Which I think implies, Michael, they didn't like him much either. They didn't, you know, and this is the funny thing. I know, you know some of us might get tired of political rancor and, and, you know, tribalism and a divided Congress and so forth. This is the foundation of our country. They were fighting with each other from the very start. And I found that, again, sort of fascinating because coming from knowing so much about China and working in China, that, you know, Franklin died 232 years ago. That's nothing. I mean, that's really a drop in the hat when you yeah. talk about Chinese history. Um, and so you realize, like, Franklin, I think, was taught to me in school as, as history or as ancient history, if that's the case. Right. You know, a, maybe a lithograph image in a history book, right? This, this kind of balding man with, you know, bifocals yeah. on. But I wanted him to come alive. And so in the book, I you know, it's a biography of his death. It's sort of a mortography, right? Because he... He did live on through his will, and he is still with us because his money and his gifts are still paying out and still being used today. And I definitely want to dive into that, but I can't go too far away from his family without, yeah. without talking about Deborah. I had never read anything ever anywhere, Michael, before you about Deborah, which is his spouse. Tell me a little bit about this spouse of his that I knew nothing about. I'm glad you said that. I was shocked when I went back and looked, you know, when you, when you face the shelf of Franklin biographies, the shelves are bending, you know, they're sure, so heavy, right. there's so many of them. <laughs> and I was shocked in reading all of those before I started that Deborah always kind of gets a walk-on role in the story of his life, right? She comes yeah. on stage, she entraps him, and then she goes and, you know, sits in her shift of toe and, and, and doesn't seem to really do anything. And in the book, I even talk about all the adjectives that his biographers use for her. Um, and I thought, well, wait a minute, let's look, let's look closer at this because Franklin got his start because of Deborah. They inherited her parents' uh, property in Philadelphia. Um, that allowed them to start their shop, their print shop together. And Deborah, you know, at a time, this is long before the American dollar obviously was made official currency. 
long before a time even where the British pound was being used as official currency in the port of Philadelphia, you can look at the ledgers from their shop and she's calculating transactions in Spanish money and Mexican silver dollars and British money and in different um, denominations and stuff. And she's making change in that. So she's, you know, not only a good shopkeeper and a skilled tradeswoman, she's also really good at real estate investment. And it's her who's always telling Franklin, like, we should flip, you know, we should buy this lot over here on Market Street, or we should hold a mortgage on that instead. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, in the beginning of the book, I start off by saying, you know, a lot of myths of Franklin are that he's a self-made man. I think that's one of the largest myths. And he's not at all. And in his will, he acknowledges that, you know, I got help from so and so and so and so I want to pay it forward. But I think a lot of our images or our, our stories of Deborah come down to us through his autobiography, which he wrote when they had been apart for almost 30 years, an ocean separated them. And that autobiography begins, Dear Son. And I don't know about listeners, but if I were writing about my wife to my son, I probably wouldn't moon over her and talk about, you know, the, the passionate love affair we had and so forth. <laughs> so he does. He says in the autobiography, you know, she was a really good helper and we, you know, we got along great and so forth. You know, one thing fun about Franklin is you can read so many of his letters. He left 8,000 letters behind that we know of. And if you delve into those, you can find correspondence between Deborah and Franklin, which is very loving and very tender and a lot of jokes back and forth. And I wanted to let her sort of come to the fore at the beginning of this because I'm not giving away the ending here. Franklin on his tombstone could have chosen any number of epitaphs. He was a very famous person who had accomplished a lot. And in the end, he simply chose Benjamin and Deborah Franklin. He wanted to, he and his wife were, you know, joined on his tombstone. And that's all his epitaph says. You talk about some of the myths about Franklin, about being a self-made man, but there also is, you, you know, the myth that he's always been virtuous, that he's always this <laughs> virtuous character. And yet I think that a lot of the mudslinging back at him was partly because he was slinging it at them as well, you know, going yes. back and forth. But, but he also, People don't remember this. You make a good point. He owned slaves at one point. He did. He and his family. This is, a, this is the thing that drives me nuts about, you know, reading Franklin and looking back at Franklin where you go, how could someone so brilliant, you know, this great enlightenment mind and it very much, we always say, oh, he's always ahead of his time. But Franklin was absolutely, concretely, very much of his time of 18th century America and especially Philadelphia. Um, and people always have this image, I think, of like, well, slavery was limited to Southern plantations. Not at all. You know, there were enslaved people working in Boston, in Philadelphia, in New York, as Franklin euphemistically said, servants, you know, working in the houses. Um, he bought and owned slaves that worked in his print shop. His family owned, it's hard to say too, because he completely omitted this from his autobiography. And I'll get to that in a, in a, in a second why he did this. But he intermittently, he and his family owned between five and seven enslaved people. And I make a point in the book, too, to talk about this because I found in a lot of his biographies, this is sort of shunted to the back pages. Oh, and by the way, um, yeah. I wanted to make sure this was in the introduction because during Franklin's lifetime, it was no secret. And the reason it was no secret is he did an abrupt about face, you know, later in his life, I think far too late, frankly, because he was friends with leading abolitionists in Great Britain and in Philadelphia. But very late in life, he came around and said, you know, this is an abhorrence. And why, if we're fighting for liberty from a king, how in the world can we be so duplicitous to not grant that liberty to enslave people in what's going to be the United States of America? You know, when he was in his 80s, towards the end of his life, he was appointed head, the president of the Pennsylvania Society for the Abolition of Slavery. And he submitted the first petition to Congress, just the Senate and House of Representatives, asking for the abolition of slavery. And it was roundly rejected. You know, the Senate said, how could Franklin, this person who argued in the Constitutional Convention for states' rights and agreed to this, you know, compromise we have, how can he now be sounding the, the bell of liberty for this? And I think Franklin very much knew that how people were going to judge him in posterity was going to depend on the stand he took on this. And so the last act he did, the last public act he did was he wrote a scathing attack on those senators who were saying, oh, you know, how can Franklin say that the states, you know, should ban slavery? And he said, well, you know, it's funny you say this because back, I know this in North Africa, 200 years ago, there was a similar question. 
and white Christian men were being enslaved in North Africa. And the Muslim divan said, how can I release my slaves? You know, we need them here because it's so hot here. And how will we do with them if we set them free? And so Franklin, of course, was, you know, making fun of these senators and congressmen who were arguing this very point. But I think he knew he was going to be judged by this. And I can bring this around to the will very quickly here by saying, in his lifetime, Franklin never freed one of the enslaved people that he or his family owned. Only in his death, at his death did he do that. And he made a point in his will to say, my son-in-law owns a man or holds a man, I should say. And in order for me to forgive this massive debt he owes to me, he has to release this man named Bob, which his son-in-law did. And I think one of the ironies of history or sort of a fitting conclusion to this story is that Franklin Court, where Franklin, you know, the house that he designed and, and Deborah oversaw the construction of after Franklin's death became a free school for people of African descent in Philadelphia. Well, I think I mentioned, Michael, that this is a finance show, so we should really talk about the bet that he made when he changed his will. So let's talk about this. Why did Franklin go from this estate plan where he's giving a lot of his stuff to his daughter and to his grandchildren to this whole different plan that he has? What's the What's the uh, genesis of that change? So he comes back from Paris in 1785, participates in the Constitutional Convention in 1787, and he writes his will in 17, it's basically 1788 to early 1789. He's 83 years old at that moment. He sees that the college that he helped found, the Philadelphia Academy, which is today's University of Pennsylvania, has completely changed course from what he had intended. He wanted it to be what he called a practical school, teaching skills in business, such as accounting, (laughs) bookkeeping, and so forth, and practical skills that young entrepreneurs could use. Instead, he comes back from Paris and he finds that, oh, it's a gentrified university now that's sort of serving the blue bloods of Philadelphia. That was not my intention. I think he's also looking around at his fellow founders who are massively wealthy, either through marriage, such as John Adams and George Washington, or have earned their keep you know, in larger cities. And I think he's thinking, I don't want our government to be ruled by these guys because I fall out with them all the time and we have a difference of opinion about what, you know, what the republic should be. Many listeners maybe know this, you know, a lot of the great quips and sayings of Franklin's, he stole, he recycled them from, he made them better, we could say, but he he borrowed them from other thinkers and from the Bible and other sources for poor Richard's almanac. And his will is really no different. He remembers this satiric essay that a French admirer had sent to him that was basically, you know, there's this guy instead of poor Richard, his name's Fortunate Richard. And his grandfather told him, you know, if you take a little bit of money and put it in an account and let compound interest work its magic and wait 100 years, a windfall will accrue. And so in this essay, the Frenchman says that the guy's fortunate Richard does this. And then with the windfall, he decides, oh, I'm going to create things like job training programs for tradespeople. I'm going to create schools that women can attend. I'm going to create housing for workers. I'm going to create a European Union bank is this idea, right? That So there'll be less wars in Europe if they're all financially tied together. So anyway, to go back to Philadelphia, Franklin remembers this. You know, he's, he's very ill at this point. He had horrible kidney stones. He had pleurisy, you know, real scabrous lungs. And in June of 1789, a few months before he dies, he remembers this essay and he says, instead of giving all this money to my family, or instead of leaving money to have the river Schuylkill straightened, which had been done, I'm going to change it. And I'm going to use this Frenchman's idea. And I'm going to take a thousand pounds and we'll get to money conversions in a minute. Take a thousand pounds. I'm going to put one gift in a pot for Boston, where he was born, one gift in a pot for Philadelphia, where he made his fortune. And I'm going to use this money to lend to skilled tradespeople that want to open their own businesses. And they're going to pay it back at 5% interest, which was lower than the going rate at the time, over a period of 10 years. As they pay it back, the principal will go, will get larger. After 100 years, Boston and Philadelphia can use part of it to build something great for the cities. Money goes back into circulation for another 100 years to fund more tradespeople. And then after 200 years, Boston and Philadelphia can cash it out. And to put a button on this, the, the, the phrase I love in his describing this loan scheme, and we can discuss the details of this, is he said, good apprentices make good citizens. 
And it's inherent for the success of the Republic that working class people are part of its governance. And we need to help them get a leg up because working class people interact with all different kinds of people all day, different classes, different creeds, different races, different backgrounds and so forth. And they have their ear to the ground of what a community needs. And so he really wanted this to not only support business people starting out, but also so they get involved in civic life. But he also wants it to be micro loans on purpose because micro loans get repaid, like small loans get repaid. If he loans people too much money, they'll never repay it. It's funny too, because Franklin never seemed to consider that maybe some people wouldn't repay. <laughs> like He really trusted <laughs> that, oh, just like me, you know, everybody will be fine. But you're right. I mean, he's, you could credit him as one of the founders of microfinance, you know, this notion that you lend a little bit of money, pay it back with interest, and the greater good will benefit for it as the, the principle accrues. I want to, by the way, read uh, directly from the book, something that you wrote just about how amazing this, this, this whole idea was, because you write that Franklin said, blessed is he that expects nothing because he will not be disappointed. Yet you write, Franklin expects one, and you write all of these, one, yeah. <laughs> civic minded bookkeepers to step forward to administer without any compensation Two, 10 year loans to tradesmen for two centuries provided three that every borrower repaid that debt in full and four the principal's balance would snowball and could be five spent in a manner that the public democratically decided would benefit the common good like this is crazy michael like this whole thing is absolutely crazy that it would actually happen and he expected people to do it for free that's the thing that cracks me <laughs> up he expected somebody to manage this for free um, and it's really exciting to walk into archives in Boston and Philadelphia and open those loan books, you know, and see the first borrowers and sort of follow their track. You know, do they pay the money back? What becomes of them? And that's what this book traces. All of a sudden, you know, again, the book opens with Franklin's death. I really like this idea that like, let's open a book and start with the death and then let's follow the money because Franklin is still with us. This money is still circulating and still being used today. That's a remarkable thing. Even though, as you know, and no spoilers, Boston and Philadelphia made a lot of mistakes in managing this money. There's a lot we can learn from this about investment strategies and how to handle your bequests or not to handle them. Well, and that's what I was going to to say here is that this is your story, not ours. So I do not want to give away the ending, but I do want to say this. And I want to ask you about this Yeah, is that a hundred years in these two cities have been bequeathed the same amount of money. And yet the amount of money they have at the end of a hundred years is vastly different. Vastly different. Well, and here's the, this is the fascinating thing. The month, the sums are vastly different. So the press at the time was saying, oh, one city won, you know, was doing much better. Yeah. But at the same time, in terms of following Franklin's wishes, the city that had far less money adhered closest to his idea of what he wanted this money to do. And I find that fascinating. And the change was, you know, this is Franklin did not foresee the Industrial Revolution he did not foresee the rise of professional money managers. He had no idea what an investment bank was. You know, he participated in the first public offering ever uh, in the Bank of the United States. He bought a share in that to support Alexander Hamilton and, and the process of it. But the New York Stock Exchange didn't open until 1792, two years after Franklin died. You know, earlier, I, I, I flash back in the book, there was a, a time in his life when he was in he was a colonial agent for Pennsylvania working in London, and he had been entrusted with a large amount of money that Pennsylvania had sent over to him, and he was supposed to repay debtors in London. And people in London had said to him, oh, you should invest this money in the market. You know, the Seven Years' War is about to end. And Franklin, against his better judgment, invested in it and lost a ton. And so he was always very skeptical about speculation, skeptical about speculation that has a nice ring to it. And yeah. yet, with his own money, one of the cities said, we're going to speculate with it, and we're going to make his nest egg accrue in value, where the other city said, no, Franklin said we should be lending this to tradesmen, so we should start giving it to them. But again, didn't foresee the War of 1812, didn't foresee the great financial crash of 1819, didn't foresee the shuttering of the second United States Bank you know, under Andrew Jackson's presidency. A lot of things happened, right? Didn't foresee the Civil War, obviously. And again, to put this back, is just I, I find it so fascinating that through all of that, 
Franklin's money still limped on. And even after 100 years, you know, and the cities could not agree with what to do with it. In 1890, the centennial of his death, nothing was done. You know, this is a very American story. This is lawsuits and judges. And I try to make this enjoyable for the reader. It's really a general audience book. You know, it takes over a decade. And I think part of Franklin, you know, I think when Franklin, if Franklin were to have witnessed that, he probably would have been happy to see that public debate was still alive and well, and that there was a happy resolution, both at the 100-year mark and the 200-year mark of how his money was used. I think he'd be happy in the end of how it was used. Well, and that, that was my last question, which was, while it didn't work the way that he thought that it would have worked, do you think in the end, posthumously, Michael, he proves his point? Does he prove his point? He does in that... He was right to bet on skilled workers of the American working class. I mean, he'd be shocked if he were to come back today, how this mo- more people are employed in nonprofit organizations than they are in manufacturing in the United States. And that I think that, you know, the figures is, is constantly in flux a little bit, but I think it's about 2%, less than 2% of Americans are millionaires, yet they form the majority of Congress. Less than 2% of Congress people have ever held a working class job. He'd be very chagrined at this, obviously, and disappointed. And he'd say, where is the disconnect? Are there working class voices in our representative democracy today? And I think he'd be chagrined at that. At the same time, he was a founding father of philanthropy, and he was a great charitable giver, and he believed in anonymous giving. He did not want his name on any of the projects he created. He did not want his name on his inventions. He never applied for exclusive commercial use for his inventions. There wasn't a patent office yet until Thomas Jefferson became Secretary of State, but he could have. And he always said, no, I benefit from other inventions and technology, so my inventions and technology should benefit the public as well. So I think right today, he'd probably be excited about the open source movement and say, yes, that's exactly (laughs) what I thought too. I don't know where he'd stand on publishing and copyrights. As an author, I feel a bit you know, I'm on the fence about this. Although yes, it's a whole- listeners, I'm just as happy if you go to the library as, as buying the book. But yeah. yeah, it'd be a mixed bag, right? It's fun at the end of the book to sort of speculate about what would Franklin make of our current state of affairs, you know, vis-a-vis philanthropy, his inventions, technology, and then the working class and what became of his bequest. Well, I found the whole ride wholly in- enjoyable and just a great look at at not just this great man, but at society through a completely different lens. And to your point uh, that you mentioned earlier, we always bemoan all the fighting going on right now in, in Washington and with our politicians and on our TV channels. And yeah. there is something nice to see that it was happening back then. There's something a little, <laughs> a little, a little nice to know. You know what? This is nothing new. This is okay. Right. And hopefully we'll get through this again. I guess the question I would end with this is, is anyone, are any of our quote unquote states people, you know, are any of them thinking of the Americans of the year 2,422, the way Franklin was thinking 200 years ahead, you know, on his deathbed, what can I leave behind that my name and my ideas and my values and my legacy are going to remain in circulation? How can I be of use was what thing, one thing he wrote in his will. And I don't know that anybody today is asking those questions, right? What's our country going to look like 200 years from today? And what can we be doing right now to ensure that it looks like what we want it to look like? The book is called Benjamin Franklin's Last Bet, and it is available everywhere as of yesterday. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about our namesake for this show. I love the fact that, and and I can feel it in this discussion that you and I just had, that this is... I don't know. It seems, Michael, to be a very personal project for you. Like if it thrills you, it's going to thrill us. And and the book definitely did. So thank you so much for taking that on. Keep stacking those Benjamins. <laughs> Amen, brother. Hey, Nick Loper here from the Side Hustle Show. When I'm not helping people earn money outside of their day job, I'm stacking Benjamins. Huge thanks to Michael Meyer for spending some time with us. So interesting, OG, to read about n- not that time but also hear these lessons about uh, Franklin and his life and what a, what a giving person, what a sad tale in some ways, but the fact that he made this bet that that people were going to keep this bet of his alive for a hundred or 200 years and be paid zero to do it kind of shows what an optimist this guy was, but I don't really want to talk about that. Let's go back to Doug's trivia. He said, 
NKOB, New Kid on Block. The Block. New Kid on the Block. It's it's NKOTB, right? Well, the T is implied and it ruins the, the tempo. It ruins the panache of the phrase. You can't say NKOTB. It just doesn't roll off the tongue. Well, the fine folks of the Wahlbergs would disagree, and uh, they do think that the T is important. Yeah, well, they got it wrong. I think there's a fair part of our audience that's like, thank goodness you said this at all, but I had no idea what the hell Doug was talking about when he said NKOB. <laughs> well, yes, because nobody knows what that means. They know what <laughs> that's NKOB That's a funny way to spell knob. <laughs> they know what NKOTB means. The, fir- the, but, the first uh, time I read your script, Doug, I thought it was noob. I thought it was a different, it was like some... <laughs> Some Gen Z way of saying noob. I'm like, N-K-O-B. Oh, that's, yeah. Whole whole different thing. And there's still a quarter of our audience that has no idea what the hell we're still talking about. So, but. so worth using up airtime to this important. explain this. This is what everybody tunes in for. Between them and sync. Hey, let's throw out David Lifeline. Why don't we? Huh? Let's get back to work, guys. Tech- That's a great novel idea. Yeah. Tackle some of life's most important questions. You know, our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put OG what you value first. Uh, well, f- right now it's watching the Masters. So I have it. The Masters uh, ended on Sunday. On my OG. phone. I- I'm rewatching oh, it. Oh, re- Yes. <laughs> Nice save. And that's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackybedjamins.com slash havenlife now to get a free quote. You can pause this whenever somebody's doing a putt. And uh, during the commercial break, you can get your Haven Life Insurance done. I mean, how great is that? More time. It's that quick. Watching golf. Application simple online. Instant coverage decision. Price is affordable. You get this done, people. We talk all the time about your risk management. Just get it done. Get it done. Of course, all your policies are issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160 years old. Today, we're going to throw out Thaven Lifeline to our new friend, Stephen. Say hi, Stephen. Hey, Joe and OG. I had a question regarding cost of living in different areas in the country. I've been thinking about if it's worth it to move to a higher cost of living area just for the 401k benefits. For example, I'm currently in the central Florida area and using a couple cost of living calculators. Some of the higher ranking cities would put it anywhere from 175% to 250% of my current salary in these higher areas. So, for example, if I make $100,000 in the central Florida area and I put 10% into a 401k, I'd get $10,000 in retirement. But if I live somewhere like Arlington, Virginia, and my salary is $200,000 and I put 10% away, I get $20,000 for 401k. Does it make sense to move to one of these areas to beef up your 401k contributions? I know there's a lot of other assumptions that can be made regarding where you want to live, cost of living, et cetera, et cetera. But assuming a constant in many other things, do you think this is a worthwhile strategy? Thanks. Tell Doug I said hi. Doug Stevens says hi. Hey, Stephen. How are you? Great to hear from you again. Uh, Thanks for that question, Stephen, because this is a great conundrum, OG. You have more opportunities in these cities, but the cost of living is through the roof. So is there some ROI equation you use in your head or let's uh, let's bandy about Stephen's question? Well, I I think at the very end, he said, you know, I understand that there's a lot of other other factors, but let's not count those. Let's just count whether or not it's better to save 10,000 more toward retirement. (laughs) It's like the whole reason that it costs two hundred grand in Arlington versus a hundred thousand in you know wherever Florida is because of the fact that you know rent isn't eight hundred bucks it's twenty three hundred bucks and because you know going out to dinner isn't fifty bucks it's a hundred and fifty bucks so the question isn't whether or not you would get a higher pay raise and therefore be able to put more money into your four hundred one k whether or not you would even be able to with that with the extra cash because there's a reason for that you know now granted. If you're saving twenty thousand dollars instead of ten, yes, you will have more money in the future. But then, guess what? You're living in that community, so in the future, your expenses are going to be greater than what they are in your current community. So you need to save that extra ten thousand dollars in your example in order to stick with your cost of living once you do retire. And now you could say, "Well, I'm going to just move there temporarily for the next thirty years, and then come back to." you know, low cost of living area. But the reality is, is that that won't happen. You'll have all of your friends and connections and all that sort of stuff will be in this new area and uh, and you'll want to keep on living there probably, or at least 
somewhere similar. So I don't think that you can look at it in a vacuum and say, should I go make more money and try to keep my expenses the same? I will tell you, however, that part of the pandemic issue over the last couple of years has been people doing that from a virtual standpoint. Yeah. I got a job in San Francisco, but I moved to Utah. And because I was virtual, my boss didn't know. And I'm arbitraging that. I'm getting my San Francisco pay, but I'm living in some other lower cost of living area. And that's affording me the opportunity to buy a bigger house or invest more in my 401k or whatever. So I think that is an option, right? Like if you can find work that you want to do that is remote, that they'll pay you in Arlington, Virginia money and then live in Florida, that's kind of the best of both worlds, right? Because now you have the cost of living that you're accustomed to and now a salary that's much higher gives you the opportunity to really save. That's kind of how I would think about that or approach that. Probably not the point of the question, but those opportunities are starting to go away, especially some of the larger employers in those really expensive metropolises are starting to realize, hey, if you're a virtual employee, we're not paying you Washington, D.C. or San Francisco rates. It's not totally widespread yet, but there is a movement towards that because they realize we don't need to cover your cost of living in uh, New York City if you're going to be in Ohio. I would say the exact opposite is happening based on my experiences. That might be what employers are trying to do, but that's not happening in real life because compensation to employees is going up so much than people who, I'll just pick on two cities, the Arlington, Virginia that he used and let's say... Um, Texarkana. Texarkana. That's a great example. We'll use Texarkana. So the problem is, is that the folks in Texarkana are getting paid Arlington money and then they're spending their money in Texarkana, but because they have more of it than the average person that's driving the costs up in those local areas, which are then causing the employers in the local areas to also then have to raise their price or raise their, you know, compensation costs just because of the people that are coming into those areas. Yeah, I don't. Um, I'm going to disagree with you on that. I don't. Th I think that's possible, and but I think that trickle down takes a long time to force the employers to have to raise their rates just because of the the external money that's coming in. I think more is just finding employees right now. They have to raise rates. Have you been to a restaurant in the last two years? Why would I do that? Exactly. Other than the sizzler, you mean? Yeah. Um, no, I think the quick rising salaries has more to do with trying to attract workers than it does because of this remoteness uh, and money going to different communities. Okay. That's, that's, my, that's my stance. Good to know. You don't like it when people disagree with you, do you? <laughs> I just I just don't like it when people are wrong. It's just insulting to them. Well, and I think that this drive, this is part of the great resignation, I think, is that hey, I decide yeah, that's what I'm saying. You tell me that you tell me that I can work from anywhere and then you take my payback from doing that. I'm gonna go find a different employer that doesn't do that. I think the employee has the upper hand there. Mm -hmm. I think the employee goes, okay, yeah, you go ahead and uh, decide that you're going to recoup this because I decide I want to live in Texarkana instead, which by the way, brings up another point, which is I feel like people, people move thinking about opportunities and don't think a lot about community. And this especially worries me hmm. when people tell me, oh, gee, that when they get to retirement, they're going to move. I saw this firsthand that we had built up these friendships of a decade of living in our town. And then we moved away. Don't get me wrong. We made new friends in Detroit and I love my two years there, but man, did we miss those people in Texarkana so much. And I think we look at the, the financial upside of making a move and not at what it's going to do to our overall happiness. Well, that's what I mean. I don't think that unless you're with your people, right? If you, work in a space or a community and and that happens to be the thing that you you guys all do and I'm using air quotes of we all vacation in Florida in this community or we all all the people in my my circle tend to have this experience then you're not going to move and if you do you're not going to like it because all of the connections and how much of a pain in the butt is it to figure out like where the grocery store yeah, is? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, just the normal like process of doing life is automated when you're, you know, you've been in a community for 10 or 15 years or 20 or 30. And then all of a sudden you're going to pack all your stuff, leave all your friends and family and go move to another area. I don't know. I guess it happens, but yeah. Yeah. 
but it's for a different group of people, I think. We're way off of Stephen's question, but I'm curious to know your thoughts on it. It, it seems like the premise for his question of, of moving to maybe maximize 401k savings feels a little analogous to worrying about fees in your 401ks versus just saving more. Like it, it seems a little cart before the horsey. Is that, am I misunderstanding that? I think it is true some ways. I do think that if you're young being in a place where there's a lot more opportunity, and I think that no matter what happens with COVID or people moving to other places and being able to do Zoom meetings, there still is something about proximity that drives yeah. things. Like Farnoosh Tarabi and I have had this discussion a lot where, where Farnoosh's MO about being in New York is to be in New York, period. There's so many opportunities. She's right there. Bobby Rebel, who used to do our Money with Friends show, Bobby and I would talk about that. She lives in New York for a reason that she gets because all Because it's New York. Yeah, she's yeah. right down the street. They could call me and fly me in from Texarkana, or they can call Bobby, who can be there in half an hour. You know, I mean, right. which one are you going to do? So I think there is something to be said for Stephen. If you're early in your career, if you're looking to move up the ladder and network face to face with people, which I still also think, man, there's nothing better than getting together face to face. And it is harder when you're in, in the small community. I think there's a lot to weigh there, OG, much more than that 401k. Which is the whole thing you wanted to discount. And I think that's the heart of the that's the heart of the question. Yeah. Where where are you at in your career? Where are you at in your friendships? I think later in life in my career, where I know I can work from anywhere and I don't need to be in New York, it'd be nice, but I think we're gonna do okay if I'm not in New York, it's okay. If I were twenty five right now, I would have totally moved to New York. Stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. If you've got a question for us, thanks for that one, Stephen. And you know what? Because Stephen was brave enough to call in, we are going to uh, give him some Stacky Benjamin swag, Stacky Benjamin's Haven Life swag. Yeah. Make sure you call in if you really don't care how far away from your question we get during our answer. <laughs> I thought that was the heart of his question. I think the heart of his question is the stuff that he doesn't want to talk about. I think that is, that is clearly the heart. So you Stephen got I right think, into Stephen's head, didn't you? I think we nailed it. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> Stackybenjamins.com <laughs> slash voicemail. Hey, a uh, couple quick things. If you are in Columbus, Ohio today, I am going to be, oh. Emily Guy Birkin and I are going to be two places. We are at uh, Kenyon University, where Emily graduated from, at one o'clock with a uh, presentation there for students, but I think it's open to the public. I believe it's at the bookstore. Stackybenjamins.com slash stacked for more on that. But the big one is at 7 p.m. at Easton, beautiful Barnes and Noble there. Emily and I will be there with uh, the locals. The townies. Chatting about stacked, stackybenjamins.com slash stacked. If it's not sold out, and it very well might be, we're in Cleveland tomorrow, but it's a small venue. It holds about 35 people, and uh, it's going to be a great time. If it's not, join us at Bookhouse Brewing there in Cleveland tomorrow. Then next week, Detroit on Monday, Grand Rapids Tuesday, Kalamazoo Wednesday, Thursday and Friday are Chicago and Aurora, and then Milwaukee on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked. New one every day, OG, next week. But if you're not here for surround sound or book tour stuff, you're actually here to make a difference in your life. You know what that means? Surrounding yourself with good people, and OG and his team are taking clients, so... If you want to think bigger about your goals, stackingbenjamins.com slash OG. Much better answer than just coming and having your book signed. Let's get moving. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, man, you got it from here. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, interest rates, while they're higher, interest rates are still historically low. But don't start there with your planning. Begin with your strategy before taking out any debt. Second, take some advice from Michael Meyer. Franklin's bet? By thinking bigger, Franklin achieved so much. And so can you. Where are you thinking small in your life? What's your legacy going to be? Who can you help? Let's make life an adventure, whether you give away your money to Boston or Philadelphia, or probably not. But the big lesson? You're never too old to declare independence of your colonies. You never know what kind of revolution you'll start. Thanks to Michael Meyer for joining us today. His book, Ben Franklin's Last Bet, is available anywhere you debate the effects of taxing the colonies on the empire as a whole. 
This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. I got to tell you, I love being on the East Coast, guys, where there's trains like every hour. I just booked a train uh, from Baltimore into Washington for our event there. And being able to pull up the train schedule two days before and go, oh, I'm getting on this one is just exciting. I would love that if we had that in the middle of America. Like I know the infrastructure costs are huge, but imagine what that would do for like Kansas City or for St. Louis, you know, to have these high-speed rails running between those cities. Kill the automotive industry? (laughs) You know what's funny? The automotive industry has said that forever. Let me tell you what what I think the problem is with the automotive industry. Oh, here we go. I feel... Settle in. I feel like like Detroit... (laughs) Well, 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 what's funny, Doug, is that you look at other automotive companies and look at what they've done with transportation. It's like Apple... Apple changed themselves from a technology company, a computer company, into a consumer devices company that makes it easier for you to consume, to consume media, consume stuff, to talk to your friends. They became a communication company in a lot of ways. I feel like Detroit is like, uh, we got to make sure we protect the automobile. What? If Detroit had positioned themselves as transportation experts instead of automotive experts, I don't think Detroit would have had half the problems that Detroit's had. So, no, it's not going to kill the damn car. Like, it killed the car in Germany, totally killing the car in Japan. Well, but the reason that that automotive became the primary mode of transportation was because the automotive industry bought up all of those local train routes in those cities and let them die. I mean, it's it's yes. not it's not a secret. And shut them down. They did it on purpose. Yeah. I'm not saying that was, I'm like, I'm. I don't know if that was right or wrong, but that's that was their business strategy was to make their product and mode of transportation more necessary and attractive to everybody but living imagine, in those areas. Imagine had they thought bigger and said, we are not automotive experts. We are transportation experts. Yeah, there's no point in thinking. Like how like freaking I'm, great would that? What do you mean there's no point? There's no point in me imagining that because it, it already happened. It <laughs> and, and now there's they no point in trying today. to. Why? 
They could why totally, would you do that? Why? It, it's not like Detroit is kicking ass right now. I mean, if you looked at my GM stock, <laughs> my GM stock is through the freaking floor. I mean, don't get me wrong. I I love Mary Barra, and I think that they're, you know, what whatever. There's a lot to like with her keeping that company relevant. But holy crap, man. Apple at some point changed the game for themselves, and look at where they are today. If you think your stock is cratering right now, let's have her announce the fact that they're going to go yeah. buy up, you know, 100,000 acres of train track in Kansas City. We're getting into trains. <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> Hold on, guys. Check this out. I know you guys really like that Silverado, but what? It's a big announcement dad, look, coming. Dad, dad, watch. Dad, dad, look. Sounds like this. <laughs> But they're going to be electric trains. That's cool now, right? It'll be really awesome. There was an issue coming from Dallas. They're trying to, they've been trying this for a long time to connect Dallas and Houston. High speed line. It's about five hours. That's become a nightmare, a a legal nightmare. Well, you know, and then you you run into the issue of like the land required, right? And it's like on one hand of it, you you side with the common good and this would be helpful for all the economies and this would be helpful for families and you know you can live in Dallas and work in Houston and you know have a, a 60 minute commute basically all on train and and then but then on the other side of it you go but that's that guy's farm that's his ranch why why should the government get to come in and go we need this so kiss our eminent ass. domain's been happening forever i know i agree i don't love it but it's a possibility that's what's holding all of this up is that it's not eminent domain because it's not the government who's doing it. It's a private Uh, industry. So they have to buy it. And even if it were subjugated to that, you know, again, kind of a little common good, but also like, why do I have to be the one that gets screwed? Why don't you move that track over like 50 miles that way and screw that? Totally agree. Joe, you were telling me something interesting. I didn't know about this came up with you and I, like, I don't know, a year ago, but you were saying with all of the, I'll say dormant railway lines, they've retained the underlying rights to all of those old rail beds and they just lease out the, am I getting this right at all? Did you tell me this story? Yeah, it's super cool. So in Texarkana, I'm part of this group called partnership for the pathway. I'm on their board uh, because I love this idea of safe walking paths in towns, these beautiful walking trails. Send your donations to Pathways for the Partnership. That's not why I asked you the question. Please do. I'm just telling you why I know this. I know this because then we get on all this transportation stuff, and you actually learn a ton about Amtrak that I never wanted to know, that now I know about why Amtrak does not work but most of the the time. But part of that was this. that So if there's a rail bed they're not using, they will do a lease to a government entity the government and and it's a zero cost lease. The government entity then partners with a group like ours that turns it into a walkway or like the Katy Trail in Dallas, as an example, is a beautiful one. And they'll turn this into a trail. But the Union Pacific or whoever the railway is reserves the right to take it back yeah. whenever they want. So, they can take it back. The chance of them taking it back is probably close right. to zero. Except like I didn't know about the long planned route between Dallas and Houston. Sounds like a great idea. And my perception as a Midwesterner is, is that there are old like stockyard rail lines going between all of those Western cities. And I'm surprised there isn't already right of way that they could just claim in that kind of same scenario you just discussed and say, yep, there's where we're going to, we don't have to steal any from any private citizens. I guess not. I mean, there's a lot of train usage still. It's not for commuter. You know, there's not commuter trains, but there's still, I don't know. That's why Warren Buffett owns a freaking train company, right? right? right. Because there's so much transportation and mo- not person transportation, but products and, and goods still is the most economical way to transport stuff across our across our country well, as for sure. via train. For sure. So, And to make it high-speed rail, though, is a whole different level of Eventually. infrastructure. So even if, even if those rails exist, which to your point, Doug, they probably do, the whole thing would need to be. Yeah, we're, we're so far out of our own league on, we, I don't think any of the three of us really know this stuff, but that's what I'm thinking. There's, we're just enthusiasts. There's people yeah. that are in this industry. They're screaming at their device right now. I'm not an enthusiast. Morons. Nope. I'm not an enthusiast. I I'm totally no an interest in being on a train ever, regardless of how I fast it goes. I freaking love trains. If you look at mm. Britain, they were able to build, I'll say, moderate high speed, not super high speed stuff like they have in Japan or France, but they figured it out. 
So can we. We could. If, oh, Joe, is what you're saying is we could figure it out if the automotive companies just applied themselves? <laughs> yes. We have the geniuses in Detroit. We have all these smart people, man. Why the hell is Detroit a depressed part of the nation? Mm -hmm. I just I just don't get it. There's a huge brain trust in Detroit, and we're not using it. So anyway, we'll put a pin on it there. How about that? God. Come on, Detroit. Do this. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help with special guest Chris Browning. You know, I'll give a shout out. I have two coworkers, Mandy, who love your podcast. They found out about me podcasting because of the last time I was on, on your podcast, That's the Brown Ambition. <laughs> we outed you. We yeah, you did. So you. spread it out a little bit further. Chances are if you work in an office with black women, Brown Ambition <laughs> is somewhere. Brown Ambition. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.